Well, so my name is Tom Hall. I'm that Tommy Hall on the uh, Intertweet. I've recently changed jobs. I work for a company called FutureLearn doing massively open online courses in the UK with UK unis and stuff. Not really going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about why one might want to use uh, ClojureScript. So my favourite Brendan Eich quote about JavaScript is, the part that's good is not original, the part that's original is not good. So he was hired to do Scheme in the browser and then uh, they wanted to see like syntax, etc. Everybody kind of knows the story. So the good bits of JavaScript are like the functional bits in my opinion. So why might one use Clojure? It's like a modern Lisp with uh, uh, a rich set of data structures, unlike Scheme where you have to build everything from consoles. Uh, it's got some things you might expect in a modern programming language. Closure script actually targets JavaScript, so whereas the original closure um, runtime is on the JVM, uh, Closure script actually uses the Java virtual machine, generates JavaScript, which then is then uh, compatible with the Google Closure with an S uh, advanced mode compilation. So you have some pretty tight output uh, JavaScript, uh, so pretty inscrutable output JavaScript as well. Um, <clears throat> So I started looking at this for some uh, genetic algorithm stuff I've been doing and genetic programming stuff, so kind of distributing things, getting things into people's computers, making them warm, finding solutions to problems. Uh, a chap called David Nolan, um, who's doing a lot of stuff in uh, ClojureScript at the minute, is a front-end guy for uh, the New York Times, I think, ported the Minecraft demo into uh, ClojureScript, so it's just showing that we can sort of keep pace with JavaScript and still be sort of nice and, and functional. Um, other reasons you might want to use uh, Clojure would be there's a uh, range of great books. So SICP that I mentioned before, the structure and interpretation of computer programs. Um, there's a s series of books called The Reason Schema is the latest one. There's The Season Schema and The, and the Little Schema, all sort of introductions to computation, quite sort of might make you a better programmer even if you don't wind up using Scheme. Um, what I'm interested in at the moment, and sorry, I know that was very quick, but uh, also uh, a lot of you have perhaps seen that before. What I'm interested in at the moment is core async. So similar to a few people have been saying about um, callbacks being a bit of a problem to manage, etc. Um, there's a move in the Clojure community in both the JVM and in ClojureScript towards a Go style um, programming model based on Tony Hawes uh, communicating sequential processes. So David's got some nice examples. So uh, 10,000 Go blocks here, uh, all updating the table. Uh, and the model is basically channels a la the Go language. So you create channels, you put messages on them. They're actually blocking it by default. So you have a little bit of back pressure. So if you put, then it blocks. And the nice thing is, um, so you can actually, the consumer will control the speed. And the nice thing is that, um, as I say, you sort of define these channels. Uh, it's a, it, it's a uh, concurrent way of writing the code. And it's actually written in the form of a macro that basically unpacks uh, the code and rewrites it as a, as a state machine, so manages all of the, the callbacks for you. So I've got a few examples. So 100,000 DOM updates, you can see core asyncs going through, a number of channels, each strip of color is a different channel making changes. And the idea is that we haven't blocked the event loop that, that, that we can still type, etc. So that's where I was last time, where I was kind of a bit hand wavy because I hadn't quite studied the core async stuff. So I've had a play of this according to GitHub for the last 17 hours, and that includes actually no sleep. So um, the reason I'm doing this talk is because I was kind of really excited when I arrived and showing it, uh, all my friends that are here this thing I've been doing. So I'll just very briefly talk about how the, uh, the channels work. So I hope you can read that code. The, the Go macro is the, is, the, is the macro that does the uh, inversion of control. So wherever it sees a channel operation, so the uh, right angle bracket is put into the channel. So the final two lines is adding the string high into channel one and the string there into channel two. So from the programming standpoint, you have three concurrent things. Uh, the Go block with the while true, so that's an infinite loop. That's an infinite loop reading. Alt bang is one of the, the uh, core async constructs. So that takes a list of channels and will re return a value in a channel. So you see we've got the left bind in there. We say 
read from these two channels, the first thing that comes out, you're guaranteed it's only one, but the order is determined by the runtime. So a particular value, a particular channel, and just print it. So that actually won't do anything until something's inserted into the channels. So we basically send into channel one, hi, and channel two, there. And not necessarily in order, but at some point our, other, our top Go, go uh, process will say uh, read the value from channel, channel one, et cetera. So we would actually be blocking at that point, trying to read from channel one and channel two, but only two messages will have come through. And then, um, is that clear? That was a bit waffly. But that, okay, good. So the, an example from the Go uh, language guide is using channels and a nice feature here, and I, don't, I can't spend too long on it, a nice feature here is channels of first class. So similarly to functions being first class in JavaScript, i.e. they can be uh, passed as arguments, taken as arguments, oh, sorry, returned, as, as, uh, returned from functions, passed as arguments, stored in data structures. Channels are the same, channels are first class in this model, so you can pass channels around. So one, one feature is timeouts are handled by a timeout channel, so you can read alt bang off a timeout channel, and if you don't get anything from the things you're interested in, you can take some action based on receiving the timeout signal. And that's really nice because if you have nested processes, you can pass through the timeout signal, and, they, and they'll all sort of timeout at the same time, which is quite nice here. So what we're doing here is we're saying we need to fetch three things, a web page, an image, and a video, and we're gonna hit each of them twice, and we're gonna, the first one that responds will like, get added to the queue, and then we read off the queue, and then if we've got the three things, we don't care about the others, or we can time out after a certain time. So this is a pattern for firing off six requests to six different things. Taking any, as soon as we've got one of each thing, we just want to return, or if they don't return in time, we just want to bomb out and use the, the, uh, the timeout signal. So, quick example. And what I've spent the evening doing is I thought it would be really nice if we made a version of the game of life where the cells themselves were channels and they knew about their neighbors and whenever they're, if you remember the game of life, usually there's an external time and it kind of ticks and for every cell you say, what does this neighborhood look like? Is it alive or dead? And if you remember, I think three or four will keep the cells alive. If, if, if you're dead and you've got three, you come alive. If, you, if you've got more than four or four or more, then you die. So everybody's seen the game of life, I think. So this is an implementation using core async with um, every uh, cell there is its own channel. I did a quick loop and made it aware of the other channels around it. So whenever a cell transitions, it informs its neighbors and then the state kind of propagates around. So you have like, this is, this is running, as I say, a channel for every single uh, cell here. Um, and I thought that was quite cool. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't mean to beg for applause, excuse me. Um, so yeah, that was fun. So I've said in the past that the CoffeeScript kind of writes the JavaScript you would have written. So you can't write CoffeeScript without knowing JavaScript and it saves you from some of the hassle. ClojureScript, I've said, writes the the JavaScript you would have writ written if you were ten tenacious and mental. So the, the non clear Google Closure Advanced Mode compiled JavaScript is, well, wait, Emacs is struggling to get to the bottom of the file, so it is um, 38,000 lines. Um, and the, the Google Advanced Mode com compiled version is only 6,000, so the, the dead code elimination it uses, considering that I require a bunch of libraries and stuff. Um, they have got source maps recently, but you probably don't want to be introspecting this code. But the, the nice thing is, for my logic, I got it in ClojureScript in less than 100 lines. So I removed the new lines to sort of, so I could say that. Um, <laughs> Uh, less than 100 functional lines of code. I'm sure I'll, I'll spend some time going like this uh, when I get back, uh, sat down. So just doing normal JavaScript stuff like drawing. Um, basically the draw, so every, sorry, I said every cell is a channel. 
and the drawing function is another channel. So whenever a state transitions, it tells all its neighbors and tells the draw channel that it needs to draw something. So the draw channel is actually ticking. And there's, because I've got these, uh, the concept of timeout channels I told you, so I'm artificially pausing certain things which creates a back pressure. So I, when I'm doing the, the drawing, for instance, um, well, yeah, when I do the draw, I just wait 10 milliseconds always before drawing it, so I'm only pulling it at a certain amount. And I kind of fudged it a little bit so that the, the, the display looked nice, but uh, I think it's a really nice model. So I'm writing basically as if I'm parallelizing, or as if I've got concurrent things happening, and the runtime basically handles it for me. So um, you may not like lispy things, you may not like uh, closure, but... Uh, I thought it was pretty cool, and it does actually f render at like 60 frames a second, which is about the, the fastest canvas can do, which is quite nice. Uh, so if you're curious about a, a lispy thing, but that just seems a bit too mental, like 65,000 lines of output JavaScript is weird, um, and using the Google closure module system rather than NPM, etc., there's a nice one a chappy at Mozilla's done called Wisp, which does write the JavaScript you might have written if you were a little bit odd. Rather than, rather than actually mental. Um, so that's quite nice, and it uses the node package system. It's quite interesting. Uh, the Sweet.js you've probably heard about get, gives you macros, and I added this because the previous speaker mentioned uh, generators and tracer or whatever it's called. So the, uh, there's a great article on, on David's blog about the fact that you can use the new generators feature to get this kind of concurrency. So this use the sort of communicating sequential processes type idea. I seem to have developed a stutter because I haven't slept at all. Um, and yeah, that's all. Uh, some links for you. And the slides are powered by uh, something called Remark, which I find quite cool. Thanks very much for your indulgence. <laughs>